Okay, so the evidence for evolution falls into two big categories. One is the fossil record, things that are dead, things that are extinct. The other is a comparison of things that are alive today. So let's talk about the fossil record first. So a fossil isn't just a bone or a shell. A fossil is any preserved remains of an organism. It could be footprints. It could be worm holes that have been fossilized. Any trace of a living organism is a fossil. Uh, fossils generally form when something gets buried quickly after it has died. So most things that die do not form fossils. Most things that die are completely consumed uh, by other organisms, by bacteria, and their nutrients are completely recycled. Uh, for things to be buried, this would be at the bottom of a lake, at the bottom of the sea, or by volcanic ash. Uh, Volcanic ash is the best. It's the best for dating things and seeing how old they are as well. Uh, to date fossils and tell how old they are, we can use carbon-14 dating, which we talked about before. But carbon-14 dating is very limited in how old things can be. So things that are less than 100,000 years old, we could use carbon-14 dating. Things that are older than that, we have to use other radioactive isotopes uh, like potassium argon dating and the others. Uh, things that have half-lives in the millions of years would be more appropriate for things that are older. Uh, what we can see in the fossil record is the change in what living things existed at different time periods in the Earth's history. So older things are generally in the lower rock layers, younger things in the higher rock layers, and these would be, uh, we primarily are looking for fossils in sedimentary rocks, so things like sandstone, shale, uh, limestone, because that would be the preservation of things that were slowly buried at the bottom of uh, some body of water. Uh, occasionally, geologic processes reverse those layers or flip them over. So if there's uh, an asteroid impact or a large volcanic eruption, sometimes that will flip the layers over, and then we get older to younger, and then on top of that, younger to older again. Uh, but that's, that's more unusual. These layers, although they're laid down uh, horizontally, the layers uh, with time get slanted, and often if you find a place where there's a road that's cut through these layers, uh, there's a lot of examples of these in the uh, Appalachias and in the Great Smoky Mountains. You can see the layers are tipped at a 45 degree angle sometimes. That has happened after the rocks were formed. Uh, the fossil record is very biased towards things that have hard parts, so things that have hard bones, things that have shells, are way overrepresented in the fossil record. Things that don't have hard shells, jellyfish for example, the fossil record for jellyfish is terrible, uh, because they would rarely fossilize. Um, the fossil record for frogs is, a, is terrible as well because frogs, even though they have bones, their bones are much more fragile and much less likely to fossilize. Uh, teeth are the hardest bones for mammals, so we have a lot of teeth, especially for human remains, ancient human remains, we have a lot of teeth. Teeth stuck in a piece of a lower jaw, pieces of the skull, the skull is very hard. Uh, and less of bones of the rest of the body. So uh, humerus and femurs are pretty hard. We have more of those. Uh, rib bones are quite rare because they're not very hard. So uh, the harder the bone is or the harder the shell is, the more likely we're going to find fossil remains of that. Uh, volcanic ash is excellent for preserving detail. Uh, even sometimes skin external surfaces, internal organs, embryos, and eggs are sometimes preserved by volcanic ash. Uh, an intact 
full skeleton like this here would be an extraordinarily rare find. Uh, complete skeletons are very, very rare and often become iconic named specimens like the T-Rex named Sue in the Field Museum in Chicago uh, was a rare, almost completely intact specimen. The famous skeleton of uh, the Australopithecus afarensis uh, human ancestor Lucy became an iconic specimen even though it's not even a complete skeleton, but it's about 50% of the bones are present, or pieces of the bones. So uh, the fossil record isn't a complete record. Uh, it's, it contains much more things that have bones and shells, less of things that have soft parts, and rarely internal organs and things like feathers and hair being preserved. Uh, we talked a bit uh, earlier in the semester about carbon-14 dating, but the basic idea is that there's a pretty constant amount of radioactive carbon-14 in the atmosphere in carbon dioxide. Living things are constantly taking in new, car new C4, um, carbon-14 with their food or from the carbon dioxide directly if it's a photosynthetic organism. So when something is still alive or it has recently died, we expect it to have about the same proportion of carbon-14 relative to carbon-12 as things that are alive um, and what's in the atmosphere. Once something has died, new carbon is not coming in. Carbon-14, carbon though, being radioactive, is decaying. So once something has died, if we measure the amount of carbon-14 compared to the amount of carbon-12, we will expect that ratio to go down. And so that can give us a very good approximation of how many years ago something died based on that. And carbon-14 does not decay to carbon-12, it decays to nitrogen. So it will not be part of that detectable carbon ratio anymore once it has decayed. So carbon-14 dating, though, is useless for things that are very old, like dinosaur fossils. Dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, so we have to use other isotopes for those. But it's very useful for dating things that, are, that died less than 100,000 years ago. So this covers all of human civilization uh, and many other uh, useful time periods. Um, one of the most interesting fossil finds of recent scientific history here is the discovery that a particular group of dinosaurs had feathers. Uh, it was long thought that the theropod dinosaurs, which are bipedal, which means they walk on two legs, bipedal group of dinosaurs that includes many familiar carnivorous types like uh, T-Rex and Velociraptor are theropods. It was long thought that this group might be the ancestor of modern birds. There are many similarities between theropods and birds. Uh, it has been thought for a long time that theropods were endothermic, like birds, meaning they maintain a, bo a constant body temperature. And when fossils started to come out of western China in the 1980s and 90s that were of theropod species that because of the volcanic ash preserving the exterior of these organisms, we could clearly see that these theropod dinosaurs, not birds, dinosaurs had feathers. So here's one of them. And you can see it clearly is not a bird. It has a lizard-like mouth with teeth, but we can see here preserved beautifully in the volcanic ash feathers. Uh, and it's now thought that all theropods had feathers, including T. rex velociraptor had feathers. Uh, this image will be familiar to anybody who has seen Jurassic Park. After the first movie was made, that's when these feathered theropods started to be discovered. And they do have a paleontologist who's a consultant for the movie, and uh, he told them that they should add feathers to their velociraptors. They, the, the production uh, company declined to do that. They said that people would be confused if they changed the way the velociraptors looked. 
that they wouldn't realize it was the same organism, that people wouldn't understand new scientific discoveries. Um, but you can find many images of, online of people who have uh, fixed the images from the movies. Um, it's also thought that even T. rex was covered with small downy feathers. Uh, so why did they have feathers if they couldn't fly? Uh, feathers serve another really important purpose, even for birds. So even birds that cannot fly still have body feathers. And they serve the same purpose that hair serves for mammals, and that is warmth. Uh, if theropods were endothermic, like mammals, had, being covered with fine feathers that would help them retain their body heat would be a significant advantage. Uh, may, being endothermic is very energetically expensive, and being able to conserve heat would be really important. Um, some other interesting traits that theropods share with birds are having hollow bones and fused clavicles. So the clavicle, that's your collarbone. Um, you can find your clavicle, those two little bumps at the front of your throat, that's the end of your clavicles, and we can move them independently. Uh, for birds and also for theropod dinosaurs, the, the clavicles are fused into a single piece that can't move, uh, and that's the wishbone that we pull out of the turkey. That's, that's their collarbone, fused collarbone. So theropods and birds share this weird derived trait. Uh, so that was very interesting. Um, one of the things we can tell from the fossil record is that lineages change over time, uh, mostly, because there's an exception to everything. So this is uh, the elephant lineage, and it's a good one to use as an example because there are so few members of the lineage. If we use, you know, uh, rodents or frogs, for example, there would be thousands of species. But... For the elephant lineage, there's fewer species. So there's only three species of elephants that exist today, and their closest living relatives are the manatees, which sort of makes sense. If you've ever seen a manatee in Florida, you can kind of see that, yeah, those might be related to elephants. But also hyraxes are a close relative, and they're, uh, they live in the Mideast. They're desert-dwelling, rodent-like animals. They're furry. They, you wouldn't think that they are closely related to elephants. They look more like uh, they might be closely related to rabbits or rodents, um, but they're not. DNA shows that they're uh, more closely related to elephants. So we can see that they've changed over time. If we look at this lineage here, see the little crosses? That's shorthand for extinct species. Um, the ones that went extinct the most recently, mammoths, and mastodons only went extinct at the end of the last ice age about 10,000 years ago. And again, for mammoths, um, coincidentally, when humans arrived in North America, that's when mammoths went extinct. Uh, but we can see that there's, you know, been some changes and weirdness uh, during the evolution of elephants. When Lineages don't change over time. They are the rare exception to the general rule. And sometimes these organisms are called living fossils, although that's not the best ter term for them, because uh, when people hear living fossils, they tend to think it's something that uh, was extinct and came back, but that's not what it means. Uh, it just means something that has not changed uh, much at all in millions of years. So probably the most striking example would be the horseshoe crab. They are a very primitive type of crab. They've been around since before the dinosaurs, and they really haven't changed at all. Uh, from what we could tell from looking at their fossils, there are fossils of horseshoe crabs from 250 million years ago that pretty much look like a horseshoe crab today. Uh, they're not endangered. They're very abundant. Uh, their eggs are used by, as a food source by seabirds. Um, they're very successful in their ecological niche. Um, another example would be nautilus, which are cephalopods. The other cephalopods don't have a shell. So squid, octopus, those are other cephalopods. They have lost their shell during the course of evolution. So the nautilus 
is a more primitive kind of cephalopod. Um, they're less abundant than they used to be, and they're threatened. Um, they're mostly uh, harvested now for their beautiful shells, um, but they really, they haven't changed much uh, in, for millions of years as well, like the horseshoe crab. Um, another interesting one is the coelacanth. Now, coelacanths were thought to be, have gone extinct with the dinosaurs. Many types of fish went extinct, uh, marine species, when the dinosaurs went extinct. The same cataclysmic asteroid strike that wiped out the dinosaurs also caused many other things to go extinct. Plants um, and fish uh, also went extinct. Uh, and the coelacanth was thought to be one of them. There were fossils, fossil coelacanths uh, from 70 million years ago, and that was it, nothing after that. And then in South Africa in the 1990s, there was a secretary from a research university who went down to the local fish market on her lunch break and saw this really weird fish with these odd kind of extra fleshy fins and she went back to the university and told a paleontologist who studied fish evolution, you know, you should go look at this fish. I've never seen one like it. And he went down there and bought the fish from the fish market and said, you know, we thought these went extinct 70 million years ago. Uh, and the coelacanth are extra interesting because they're not a bony fish. They're a lobe finned fish. And the lobe finned fish are considered the ancestral lineage to the tetrapods, or the four legged land animals. So they're out of the fish, they're the closest relative to land animals, um, or land um, uh, tetrapods, I should say. Um, so, why don't these lineages change? And one hypothesis was, well, maybe they don't accumulate new mutations. Because remember, the, the fuel for natural selection is new random mutations. Perhaps these organisms don't accumulate new mutations. Well, now we know that they, in fact, do. And in fact, these organisms accumulate new DNA mutations at the same rate as other similar organisms that do evolve. So why aren't they changing? Uh, so the best hypothesis now is that they're just very well adapted for their environment and no mutations have occurred that were better, that were selected for by natural selection. So they've stayed pretty much unchanged for millions of years. Uh, this, the story of whale evolution is an interesting one. Uh, this is another case like the giraffes of one that, you know, if your theory of evolution is any good, it should be able to explain really weird cases. And whales, you might know, are mammals. They're not fish. They breathe air. Uh, mammals, the, the what makes something a mammal is generally they have fur. They feed their babies milk. Um, and whales don't have fur now, but they actually do have some fur during fetal stages and then they lose it before birth. Um, but they're mammals that breathe the air and feed their babies milk. Uh, they evolved from a four-legged land animal who readapted to the sea. And until 30 years ago, there were very few whale fossils known. Uh, whales would rarely fossilize. If a whale dies in the ocean and falls to the bottom, uh, there are many species of organisms that are adapted to completely consume that whale. And a whale body, uh, the flesh will be consumed. There are bone worms that completely digest the bones. So every bit of that whale is going to be consumed. Uh, the only way a whale would fossilize is if it got buried quickly by an underground, underwater landslide or something like that that would quickly bury it and allow it to not be consumed by all these organisms. Uh, and then where would those whale fossils be? The bottom of the sea. Uh, very few of them would make it back to the surface. So uh, if finding whale fossils was a very rare event. And if you're trying to find out what land animals are the closest relatives to whales, well, this was before DNA, you need legs because the way that land animals are classified is by bone morphology of their legs and other things. So if you don't have any legs, 
it's difficult to tell what lineage they are closest to. So modern whales uh, have a tiny bit of pelvis left, but no hind limbs at all. They have no hind limb bones at all. But they do have a tiny little uh, fragment of pelvis. Now why do they still have this pelvis? Uh, probably for the bone marrow. Um, bone marrow makes red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and if you're losing your leg bones which also have bone marrow if you're losing those during the course of evolution you need to retain some bone material that has the ability to make those so probably that's why they still have a little remnant of a pelvis uh, but it's not attached to anything and they have very reduced uh, forelimbs and previous to 1990, the only intermediate fossil that was known in whale evolution was this organism, Bacillosaurus, which lived about 30 million years ago. And it still had a little remnant of a hind limb. Uh, it's called a Bacillosaurus because the guy who discovered that it and described it first thought it was a dinosaur. And the person who discovers something and describes it in the literature gets to name it, even if they were completely wrong about what kind of an organism it is. So uh, he didn't. He thought it was a dinosaur, but it's. At, we now recognize that it's a whale, um, an early whale. So um, one place where you can find uh, ancient seabed that's the right age for whale evolution, which would be between 60 and 40 million years ago, is in what's now the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert used to be uh, a shallow sea and that long ago, 40 to 60 million years ago. And so if there were transitional forms uh, between a four-legged ancestor and a whale, we might find them there. And in fact, uh, a scientist did just that, looked specifically for whale intermediate fossils uh, in sedimentary rocks of the right age. And the first one that was discovered was this one, Ambulocetus. Uh, ambulo means walking. If you're ambulatory, it means you can walk. Cetus is whale, so it literally meant walking whale, uh, a whale ancestor that still had four legs and enough hind limb to determine the closest relative, uh, which was determined to be hippos and not uh, the group that includes rhinos, which was the other guess. Um, so another interesting thing, so uh, when all this was happening, uh, also DNA technology was rapidly catching up and sequencing of whale genomes had started. And what was learned from that was that modern whales also still have genes that are involved with leg development, but they contain mutations and are inactivated. Um, so the fact that Ambulocetus uh, and also this earlier form here um, have ankle bones still was uh, how the comparison was done because their their ankle bone is unusual, more like hippos and not like the rest of mammals. And since then, DNA comparisons have confirmed that, in fact, hippos are the closest living relative to modern whales. Um, and this is a look at the ankle bone. This is looking down on ankle bones. So uh, most mammals, including primates, have an ankle bone more like this with three points on it. Uh, but whales, which would be cetaceans, hippos, and even-toed ungulates have a more unusual bone. So this would include that ambulocetus fossil. So having an uh, intermediate fossil form that had enough leg to make this comparison, even without the DNA evidence confirmed, um, who they were more closely related to. But it is nice when the DNA evidence agrees with the morphological evidence, which isn't always the case, but it's nice when that happens.